we've watched as the 100-year-old canoe was gradually brought back to life. Now it's time for it to make its maiden voyage. We put uh, several coats of paint, and here it is, ready to hit the water. But first, wood ticks. What can we do to keep them from hitching a ride? It is the best tick repellent that you can get out there, bar none. Nine million acres of forest, 1,700 miles of continuous shoreline, 4,300 lakes, 12,000 miles of streams, more than 300 waterfalls, 15 counties, two time zones, and one area code. Welcome to the Upper Peninsula. Welcome to 906 Outdoors. Lyme disease is an inflammatory disease caused by bacteria that are transmitted by ticks. Up to 50% of ticks in Lyme endemic areas are infected. Infected or not, I'm sure none of us are too thrilled about having a tick latch on for a free meal. Here's a look at something that can decrease the odds of that happening. This is Brian Anderson and I just want to talk to you today about something kind of unique. It's about wood ticks. We all hate them here in the north and we all want them dead. Many of my friends were really struggling with Lyme disease and I'm thinking, what can I do about this? Lyme disease is just so horrible for people. It's just terrible. About a year ago, I decided I need to do something about this and I started working on a website. I learned about how, what they like, what they don't like. They, uh, they don't like, for example, uh, essential oils, fruit smells, and what they really like is anything to do with humans or some blood type of animal. I start doing all this research and I start coming across this one particular product time and time again. It's called permethrin and it is the best tick repellent that you can get out there, bar none. Beats the heck out of DEET. It's not even in the same category. All right, Permethrin is basically the synthetic version of pyrethrin which is the insect repellent in a, in a chrysanthemum flower. It's odorless. So somebody's out there turkey hunting or, or deer hunting or whatever, they can put this stuff on their clothes and it's odorless. One of the best parts about this also is that once it's on your clothes, it's effective for up to six washes. I put this on my shoes, my socks, my pants, my shirt. I even put it on my hat. I started doing it last summer and guess what? I don't get ticks anymore. It's effective for ticks, chiggers, mites, mosquitoes, all kinds of little uh, nasty little bugs that we all hate. Each one of these bottles here will do about four to six outfits, pants, shirt, and everything. Spray it on your hunting clothes. Spray your backpacks. How about sleeping bags too? Even your tent you can spray with this stuff to keep those ticks off. All you do is you just spray it on. You go to your clothesline, it's best to do it outside, and you spray it on there. You can get clothes that already have permethrin treated right in the fabric. When you get permethrin treated in the clothing, it lasts up to 70 washes. That's pr practically the life of the product. You can get it from uh, uh, numerous different places. You can also, hunters, get this stuff right here from Game Hide, which is on the site, camel clothes. They call it a limitic. They use the uh, insect shield as the way that they treat the clothes. You got on practically for the life of the clothes. There's actually a company where you can actually send your own clothes, your very own clothes to them, and they will treat them for you. And the nice thing about that, they use the same kind of stuff, and they'll send them back to you, and they're also good for about 70 washings. <laughs> so if you have your own personal stuff, that's a great option right there for you too. See, the thing with permethrin is it's a thousand times more toxic to insects than it is to humans. If you get it on your skin, it's no big deal because the oil just evaporates it. But animals, it kind of hit, hits their nervous system. And I mean, ticks will do somersaults on your pants because it, it affects them. Sometimes it even kills them. <laughs> so it's some really cool stuff. 906 Outdoors is brought to you by Cooking Wild Seasonings. Make it fresh, make it yours. There's different ways that you can actually uh, kind of help tick-proof your yard. What you want to do is you want to get rid of a lot of the uh, leaves and, and tall grass around the edge of your yards. Ticks don't jump out of trees. Contrary to popular beliefs, they're going to be in low-lying stuff and they have to have uh, 
uh, like they have to get on something, like some what we call it as a host. They're going to sit on a, on a, on a branch of, of, of grass and they're going to do what they call questing. They're looking for something to grab onto, you know, something that's got blood in it, like us or, or animals, and then they're going to hitchhike with them. You can buy these little things called tick tubes. Basically what it is, it's kind of like dryer lint or cotton balls. And what I did is I took some dryer lint that my wife saved for me and I laid them out on the basement floor and I sprayed permethrin on them. Then I took some little toilet paper tubes like this here. See, I have them strategically placed down in there. And I just put some clear contact paper on the outside to kind of protect them from weather. And I put some dryer lint right in there that's been treated with permethrin, okay? And you're thinking, why in the heck is this guy doing that? Here's why. Because at night, mice, like, mice are very nocturnal. They like to walk around, they pick up stuff like this, and they take it back to their home in the ground, all right? So they make their bedding underground with dryer lint, you know, if they can find that. And then you got to remember that mice are very big uh, carriers of ticks, all right? So they have them all over them. When those ticks start to drop off, they're going to drop into this permethrin-treated dryer lint, and then they die. So that's one way that you can help limit your tick population in your yard is with dryer lint. <laughs> it, it cost me virtually nothing to do it, but if that can help take some ticks down a little bit, that's fine. Uh, you can also even put two to three foot wide hedge all the way around your yard out of wood chips, okay? Because wood chips are very rough. They can't walk over that kind of stuff. That's why <laughs> wood ticks are basically hitchhikers. So these things are explained on the site there too. It's an incredible education to go on the site there and just take some of the things that I've, I've used and, and found out about. Do what, whatever you want with them to benefit your yard. Now the permethrin is not designed to go on the skin. Like I said earlier, if you do get a little bit on your skin, that's okay. The oil in your skin is going to dissipate it, but it's not recommended at all to go on your skin. There's another product here called Picaridin, and this is designed for the skin. It's going to last on your skin for probably, you know, 8 to 12 hours, you know, 10 to 12 hours, something like that. And it's a, a lot less toxic than other things that a lot of people use. So this is what's highly recommended to use on your skin instead of DEET or other stuff like that there too. Let's say you're out in the woods and you thought, oh my gosh, I forgot I didn't put on my permethrin treated clothes. What you can do is once you get home is you take your clothes and you put them in the dryer on high for about 15 minutes because see, ticks are really best when they're around moisture. So if you put something on hot, dry, like, like a dryer, it's going to kill them in 15 minutes. What's the best way to take a tick off? The best thing to do is use a tweezers and get it down to the skin as close as you can and pull it straight up. The reason that you want to do it that way is because if you make them mad, and this sounds kind of gross, but it's the truth, they will regurgitate some of their junk in their guts into your skin. In other words, they're puking it in you. And that's where you can get some of the bad stuff. And they offer more than just Lyme. Uh, they offer other tick-borne illnesses too. All right. So you want to take it straight up. And the next thing you can do, you can also even save that tick. All right. If, if you're really concerned about it, and, and which is not a bad idea. And on the website, I also have places where you can actually send that tick in to get it examined and see if it is Lyme infested or, you know, whatever. And there's three different companies that people can use on there. If you do get what they call as a bullseye, that means, you know, uh, a dot with a circle around it, that is a sure sign that you probably have Lyme. All right. And that's taken to the next step here of what do you do next? All right. What happens is when people get Lyme, now I'm going to say right, right now, I am not a doctor. I am not a Lyme expert. I'm just here helping people know how they can prevent from getting it as best that I know of in all the research that I've done. But if somebody's suspecting Lyme, probably some of the best things to do is go to a Lyme literate doctor. On the website, I also have where you can actually put in your name and address and zip code and stuff like that, and they will pop up a couple different uh, Lyme literate doctors. I also have some, you know, Lyme clinics that are around the country, but Lyme is absolutely miserable. I've had people, you know, a lot of people that have gotten really sick from it. So 
uh, going to somebody who is really, really good at it. The regular family MD has not been trained specifically in it. And especially if somebody takes a long time to ever get diagnosed, because most people don't get diagnosed for at least a year or two after the fact, and then they're miserable with it, then they really need to go somebody to somebody who is really an expert in it so they can be treated properly. Uh, that's as best I can say about that is, is, is really go to somebody who really, really knows it well. 906 Outdoors is brought to you by Race Driven, your source for premier power sports products. It was a warm, rainy morning. A group of us were gathered on the shores of Teal Lake in anticipation. Among the anxious onlookers were Cliff and Midge Waters, the previous owners of the canoe. I'm sure Craig has been picturing this day since this saga began a year ago. When I got it, um, we had it home for about a week and um, a friend and I brought it up here to Teal Lake, the same place, and we put it in the water. Um, wanted, to, wanted to float it. Once I got it off the water and back home, ripped the canvas off of it and started um, taking the, the parts of the ribs off that were broken and then um, um, started stripping it. And then uh, took it over to Dave Osborne's uh, place and we put new ribs in it and some new planking. We first saw this 100-year-old canoe back in May, sitting on a set of horses in a garage. We've spent the winter pretty much getting it to where it's at now someplace between 1905 and probably about 1908 is when it was made. We saw it again in June when it took on a new coat of varnish. It has a, a, a richness to the finish when you see that the wood grain is completely filled up. Then again in July when it acquired a fresh new skin of canvas along with some color. We brought it back and uh, sanded it and sanded it and sanded it and put uh, filler on it and then we put uh, the primer on it and then several coats of paint and and here it is ready to hit the water well i bought it i think in 1940 in the summer of 49 and I'm <clears throat> at the time I, I was a assistant scoutmaster and I used to take the boys out on it some of overnight trips different lakes around the UP I wonder if any of my old boy scouts ever remember them um, I've been in love with that thing since I had it and my shoulders are shot and I can't paddle anymore so I sold it to a guy that would really take care of it and he really fixed it up. Been hanging in my garage for 30, 30 years or more. But uh, I enjoyed every minute of it, duck hunting, fishing and just plain traveling. Different rivers, Fence Lake, which you can't get into anymore. The Boy Scout troop spent the nights up there. One night we were paddling in the dark on a fence lake, and a beaver slapped his tail right alongside it. <laughs> the paddles went flying and everything. We thought we were going to sink. <laughs> uh, the Carp River out north of Nagani, Many lakes that uh, I can't even remember some of them. Uh, um, lake Lavasser, it wasn't called then, it was called Mud Lake then. It's been on Deer Lake many times, Teal Lake many times, Kabogam, where my cottage is, is many, many, many trips there all over the place. I had it up in Canada, but we didn't need it. But if we needed it, it was there uh, for fish. A lot of ducks used to duck hunt on the carp out north of Ishpermington and north of Nagani and shot a lot of ducks out there. Oh, it's, it's wonderful to see it there and it's, it's in much better shape and looks pretty good. Uh, but uh, I didn't enter the life of the canoe until I got married to Kip 60 years ago. And then when we had the kids, we used it quite a lot on the lake. 
and uh, even when he wasn't there. And uh, I would take the kids out on the lake. It was such a steady, sturdy canoe. It, uh, it, it was easy to handle, untippable. I was, uh, we really felt safe in it. And uh, I remember one time we went out on Kobagum and it was fairly calm in our little corner. And I got a little further past a point and I found out, uh oh, there are big waves coming at me. And I didn't dare turn around and go broadside to the waves. So I went to the far side of the lake and it went all the way around the edge where it was safe and did my arms get tired that time. But we sang along the way and made it fun and the kids didn't get scared. I was scared. <laughs> and then we picked, we picked cranberries from it because there were some cranberry patches in our, down by our dock. And uh, we, we've just had a lot of fun with it. Well, it was gray, and then I painted it green, and I like it green better than red. <laughs> but Mr. Kitchen will take good care of it, I know that. Today's show is brought to you in part by Rapid River Knife Works, home of Michigan's largest custom knife factory showroom. When I, when I got the canoe, um, Midge was there and um, such a big help in, in, in giving me information about the boat. She loves to tell stories about the boat and uh, it was obvious that she's real proud of the boat. And so as I was working on the boat, I thought, you yeah, know, Midge, that's a, a real fitting name for the boat. I remember the first night that uh, the, the Discovering program was aired, I had not been able to get a hold of the waters to tell them that it was going to be on. And um, so I called their home and Midge answered the phone and she was all excited because she had seen the program. And it turns out that one of her children was there and saw the program too and was real excited about the whole thing. So it's been almost like it's, it's come full circle. It's, you know, the, the boat and being handed over to somebody else and now it's back on the water and hopefully at some point even they can get to enjoy it. Um, to be able to take them out and, and show them the boat and, and take them out for paddles and stuff like that. When, when you paddle the boat, you look into it and all of the wood is there and, um, you know, there's the ribs and there's the planking and there's the, the, the thwarts and the seats and everything and all of the boats, the parts seem to fit and they have a, a place and the other part of it is when the boat needs to be repaired, it comes off and you put new pieces on there. And that way the boat is, is been, it's made to be used and fixed when something gets messed up on it. You know, as I think about paddling the canoe and I think about uh, the history of it, uh, the waters having it and the people that were before that and I know some of the history from the waters of the fishing and the moose trips and the, the family outings and stuff and you know I just wonder about how it's going to compare with uh, the next 30 years that we have it compared to where it's already been. It's been used a lot um, and it's just neat to think about uh, where it's been and the things that people have done with it and, and, and just you know, it's a hundred and some years old and the history behind it, it's just, it's incredible to think that now uh, I've got the thing and the next leg of its life, um, if you think about it that way. And hopefully the, the canoe will continue to be a, a good boat for, for many, many years. I think to people like Craig, Cliff and so many others, boats like this old canoe become almost alive. They develop their own personality their own traits and characteristics. Use it enough and you get to know your boat like a good friend. I've been in love with that thing since I had it and my shoulders are gone and I can't paddle anymore, otherwise he would have never got it. <laughs> After following Craig through the restoration process over the last year, and now talking with Cliff and Midge about the times they've shared with this old canoe, it's not hard to imagine what she might say or the memories she might have. There were a lot of good times up and down the lake, just roaming around and visiting with neighbors from the lakeside. I'm sure this old gal would remember Cliff and all the lakes they've seen together. 
the fish they've caught, the portages they've crossed. I'm sure she'd remember that beaver, or the many cub scouts who learned about the water and the wilderness while skimming across some UP lake sitting on her seats. I'm sure she'd remember Midge, her namesake, and that day in the wind. Or the kids, who I'm sure have a wealth of wonderful stories and tales they could tell about days spent riding along with Mom and Dad. My nickname is Midge, and uh, I had no idea that he was planning to name it that, but I'm certainly honored. <laughs> a lot of good memories, a lot of good times, and uh, I'm glad it's got a good home. She'd also remember days long before any of our time, back a hundred years ago when some canoe maker somewhere shaped her out of a pile of wood and canvas, unaware of the memories and stories that would come out of her existence unaware of the friends she'd make along the way, the places she'd see, or where she'd end up. I'm guessing the thought never crossed his mind a hundred years ago that someday a handful of people would be standing along the shore of a lake, staring in complete awe and admiration at the work of art he so casually created, now restored back to her young self and ready to meet the water once again, and push on for yet another hundred years. I wonder how many more unforgettable adventures will exist simply because of this canoe that somebody somewhere built a hundred years ago. And I wonder, in another hundred years, who will be standing along some lake somewhere in complete awe and admiration and telling stories of the times they've had and the things they've seen because of this 200 year old canoe. Feel free to join us on Facebook or visit us at 906outdoors.com for a look at all of our shows as well as the 906 Outdoors Fishing Report, shopping, and more. Thanks for watching and we invite you to join us next week for another adventure right here on 906 Outdoors.